We got a very special guest, Sarah Turney's on the show. Um, Sarah has started this unbelievable viral marketing campaign, whatever you want to call it, to try to raise awareness to get justice for her sister, Alyssa, who has uh, tragically been missing for almost uh, 20 years now. If you've been listening to the episode uh, recently, we've kind of set the scene, but uh, I'm sure we've kind of been getting things wrong and not uh, doing, you know, doing everything justice. So we wanted to bring Sarah in here so she could tell it in her own words. Uh, so thank you so much for joining. We are, uh, it's weird. I don't want to say we're excited. And I, I, even when I asked you to come on the show, I'm so, I feel like I'm walking on eggshells and I don't know exactly how to handle it because it is a tragic situation, but the point of it is raising awareness and true crime is so popular. So I'm in a weird spot where I'm just not even quite sure how to, how to handle it all. So I'll kind of let you run the show here. Yeah, I mean, thank you for having me. Honestly, it's all about getting the word out. So I'm I'm happy to be here. Great. Um, I got a chance to listen to the latest po- the latest episode, and you did an unbelievable job with like having the the phone calls recorded, which I think in like the true crime world is. Uh, I know as a viewer, that's what always grasps me when it's like direct interviews or you're hearing it from the police or for lawyers. I feel like that's what. What, what did why serial blew up the way it did is like firsthand accounts. And uh, so quickly to summarize, it sounds like this, the Phoenix police department is saying we don't have enough evidence. And if we present it to the DA or whoever goes up the next chain of command, they will say there's not enough evidence. And then you've missed your one shot to ever get this prosecution, uh, this person prosecuted. And that just sounds blatantly factually incorrect. Right. Yeah, it is incorrect. So I actually went to this uh, county attorney's office and asked them that question. I said, do you have multiple chances? And they said, you know, I can't tell you specifically, but in most cases, yeah. What they do is, you know, they accept the evidence, they look at it and they'll say, you know, we need a little bit more here or a little bit more there. Come back to us. So you can present the case multiple times. Um, So, yeah, according to all of my sources, that is absolutely incorrect. And and I feel like you are leaning towards this is like blatant lying and deceit. And I I was a little unsure, like, is, is it maybe just like the bureaucratic nature of law enforcement that we sitting at home, like that makes no sense. Of course you should be able to submit it multiple times and evidence is always changing, but maybe we just don't know kind of the rules. Like the way that those two police officers on your call kind of kept reiterating, like we just don't have enough evidence and sometimes I'm wondering, maybe we, maybe we actually don't know the ins and outs. So that makes a little more sense. But the vibe you're getting is that they're like intentionally trying to make this difficult for you. Oh, absolutely. You know, and that opinion comes from professionals, because when I was in that meeting, I didn't really know what to think of it. And then, of course, I have this audio. I, I play it for professionals in the field, law enforcement, prosecutors, that type of thing that I've, I've met through doing podcasts. And they all tell me the same thing. They're lying to you. And right. I think that it's really indicative that they were because, you know, a week later, we get this bombshell um, with essentially, you know, no new evidence obtained that they're ready to move forward. So yeah, I have to believe that that entire meeting was just to really um, make me shut up and go away. And I didn't, and I was really strong. And I literally said to them, good luck explaining this when it gets on Netflix. That was so kind. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Nara has a moment where she's like, okay, got it. I got, you know, millions of views on YouTube. I got 90,000 signatures on the petition. And it's going to be really interesting to see how you're uh, portrayed when this gets to Netflix. So I was like, coming in hot. So, so that's what that's what I'm curious about because now, um, like, I was introduced to the case through TikTok. Like, that was the first time that I ever saw anything about it. Uh, but then, after like searching on YouTube, like, there's been other specials done on it. There's been other high profile interviews done on it. Do you think that right now is the closest that you've gotten to sort of gaining mainstream attention, where it actually, you know, has the same ripple effect as some of these other documentaries that we've seen on Netflix actually get out there? Absolutely. I spent years trying to get media attention. You know, the police set me on that mission. In 2017, they sat me down and said, we can't help you. 
you know, your best chance is to get media exposure. And I begged and I pleaded um, with mainstream media and I was repeatedly ignored or told no, which, you know, happens. Um, And I did a variety of podcasts and and YouTube videos. And then I went to TikTok and it absolutely went insane. And that's Mm -hmm. when I started getting, you know, articles in L, articles in NBC News, the Daily Mail. People just started picking it up like crazy. Um, So, yeah, I attribute all of that to TikTok. Mm -hmm. which is crazy because it's like it's 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 for like you go on there and it's 16 to 21 year olds and and here me and kevin are a couple of 30 year old dudes and we see it so the first time that i saw it i thought like because you know how there's there's all these different like video filters and everything to make things look like it's age i was like there's no way that that's that that's like authentic and that's real and kevin's like no like this is like the real deal like this actually happened like it's very very uh creepy the way that it unfolds but for you like putting out that footage how much do you have in the holster ready to kind of like put out there um that we haven't seen yet I have a lot, a lot. I probably have at least 50 home videos that will have clips like that, that just indicate that there was something weird going on, that their relationship was possibly not normal. So I have a lot. Um, But, you know, I do have to be careful and think about what I put out there and make sure that it is kind of the most dynamic as opposed to something that would leave people feeling unsure and perhaps um, make them think that I'm just being malicious. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to just put anything out there for shock value. I want to put, you know, the best things I have out there in hopes of, you know, generating leads for this case. But yeah, I mean, I have endless supply of video. Mm-hmm. What the fuck? It's so weird that he was, I mean, so speak a little bit towards the, like the family dynamic. I know you kind of, uh, you explained on the, the latest episode of uh, Voices for Justice, which is Sarah's podcast. You download it now. She is, you, you explained that you had to kind of be convinced that, you know, this is your father and somebody, and who was it, by the way, who like sat you down and was like, listen, we got to talk about, you know, your dad might not be who you think he is or, or was this something you always kind of thought? Like, did, were you and your father, did you have a normal relationship? And then this like blew your mind or was this, was something kind of always off in the family? Yeah. So, you know, one thing I do want to clear up is that Alyssa and I share the same mother who passed away and then we have different fathers. So he is my biological father and Alyssa's stepfather who adopted her when she was two and a half. Um, But when we were growing up, you know, we were treated completely differently. I was given so much freedom and Alyssa had almost none. And, you know, Alyssa's four years older than me. And starting in like fourth grade, you know, I was allowed to go to school when I wanted. I could eat whatever I wanted. I could go wherever I wanted at any time. I basically ran the streets as a kid. And Alyssa had the complete opposite experience. You know, she was expected to go to school to get good grades to come home and do her homework. Um, And that only got worse as we got older. Um, So yeah, there was a lot of, you know, contention in the house. And the thing was, you know, I wasn't monitored like Alyssa was. There was a hidden camera inside of our living room vent that was there just to watch Alyssa. Um, And, you know, after she was gone, my dad took that down. But my father and I, we were super close. Um, Um, You know, our father had always said that he was going to give us away or run away. So when I was staying home from school, it was to spend time with him to make sure he wouldn't do that. Your father always said he was going to give you guys away? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He threatened to give us away all the time or said that he was just going to run away because we were, you know, uh, such horrible children, essentially. Um, But what this did was create, you know, a trauma bond with him. So Mm -hmm. my father was my best friend. I would have never assumed that he did anything. You know, this was the guy that would, you know, pick me up if I was drunk at a party that would come bring my friends gas. You know, I thought he was the cool dad. Mm -hmm. Um, So when he was arrested in 2008, what happened was I was the point person on Alyssa's case, which means they, they called me and said, we have news about your sister. The police did come down to the station and we'll tell you. And I'm in college. And I'm like, okay, sure. I go down there and they're like, well, we don't really have any news about your sister. Here's 40 minutes of backstory about what's been happening with the case. Basically, they tell me that your father has been sexually abusing 
your sister, Alyssa, for your entire life. Your father's not the man you think he is. Um, you have a sister you don't know about. He was like, it, it, just all these horrible, soul crushing things. It just shattered my entire existence, essentially. Um, but this comes directly from the police. And I still didn't believe it after that. Mm -hmm. I campaigned for my father for years after that until I kind of went to my family and people around me. And I'm like, do you think, you know, dad could have done this? And everyone was like, Sarah, everyone thinks dad did this. You are the last one to believe this. Um, so it was really hard for me. But once I came around, then I just went straight to police and said, how can I help? Yeah. And where does the pipe bomb manifesto like paranoia come in? Like, did you ever have any sense outside of his parenting, outside of the issues with Alyssa? I mean, it sounds like he's just kind of nutty in general with all this stuff. Was, was there... Did you guys know that as well? Was he former military? Former military, yeah. former law enforcement. Yeah. So yeah, he was always extremely paranoid. You know, we're in Arizona, which means there's guns everywhere. Um, so there was always guns growing up. It was never anything I thought was abnormal. We have four older brothers that, you know, enjoyed guns as well. But yeah, I mean, I had no idea about the pipe bombs in the manifesto until they came and uh, raided our home. So that's where it comes into play is, you know, the police start investigating and our father is completely uncooperative. He will not sit down for an interview. He will not give handwriting sample. He will not give DNA. He just refuses to cooperate, you know, and he sends them all these weird things like contracts between he and Alyssa that say that she's never been molested. Well, I mean, really yeah, yeah. So no, they come raid the house that, and find the bombs. To me, uh, like he thought that uh, like helped him. I think if a father or stepfather or anybody has contracts with a young girl saying I didn't molest you, it's like that's the biggest fucking red flag I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, no, for sure. I don't know why he sent that. I definitely think it's one of the most damning things. But this is a man who also repeatedly told on himself. He called Child Protective Services and said, my daughter's going to call and lie about being sexually abused. The police and said the same thing and asked if they would arrest her for being bisexual. Like so many agencies knew that something weird was going. And unfortunately, they didn't act on any of it. So I have to ask you about the letter because we did an episode uh, earlier this week where we discussed the letter. And I was like, I feel like there's been so many advancements in, uh, you know, linguistics and being able to decipher handwriting. And it was basically determined that she wrote the letter. But like, is there any type of thought process where like the letter was old and then it was used later on as sort of like a red herring? Like, what was your take on the on the letter? And by the way, the letter is stated like, I'm running away. I took $300. Right. Like, you wanted me to leave, and now I'm gone. Yeah. So there's a lot behind that note. It was analyzed, you know, by a professional and it was deemed to be her handwriting, but they also believe that it was written at two different times. I also have an email from police saying that they believe that, you know, he forced her to write that letter. Mm -hmm. And there's a few things that indicate that it's kind of old. Um, for example, when, you know, she said, Dad, I took $300 from you. One of my brothers can point to that incident that Alyssa did take $300 from him weeks before she was gone and returned the money. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of weird things behind that note. And I certainly believe that it was written on different days and that, you know, he he did force her in a certain sense. Um, I think the cover story of her taking three hundred dollars is also really convenient because she says, you know, dad, I saved my money. That money was never touched. So if you add that she took three hundred dollars, there's your cash element that can't be tracked that could, you know, supposedly say that she made it so far because she had three hundred dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. The social security number was not active. The bank accounts were active. But he can say, well, she had cash and that's how she got a bus ticket or a train ticket or whatever. Exactly. And the thing is, like the bank that, you know, we banked at or whatever, literally you could walk to from our house. So it wouldn't, you know, if you're running away, it wouldn't be a matter of, oh, my gosh, if I go to this bank, he's going to know which direction I went into. It was literally on the next main road. So if mm -hmm. she goes to the bank and takes this money, she could have still gone anywhere. It would have been no indication as to where she was going. Um, so there's no reason if she really ran away that she didn't take that money. Where does um, Alyssa's biological father factor in? Was he just out of the picture? Has he been uh, cooperative? Is he in this with you? Or, or what's the rest of the family dynamic? Sure. Um, so yeah, like I said, he's been out of Alyssa's life since she was two and a half years old. But as you know, media started coming up, he did resurface. And he is now a part of, you know, um, basically just working with the police. Was that, 
it, nothing, you know, bad there. It was just, you know, a family situation didn't work out, like go be with your stepfather. But was there any uh, issues there? There's some weirdness. There's some allegations. There's, you know, a story that my brothers can confirm that this man tried to run over our father with a car. There's just a lot of drama there. Mm -hmm. uh, but nothing I would say is directly related to Alyssa's case. That's what's weird. That's what's tough is like, and I can imagine that this is probably a problem maybe for you with like police departments. It's like, there's going to be family drama. There's always, you know, in that letter saying like, oh, uh, Sarah, you said you wanted to be gone. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure sisters have fights. I'm sure... Parents can be weird. I'm sure, you know, everybody's got maybe not skeletons, but just weird shit goes on. And and then when when that's kind of brought up as as like a deterrent or a, a roadblock for like a murder or a missing persons, that's got to be incredibly frustrating. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of that is just drama. But there's so much that isn't drama that really, um, you know, solidifies this case. Like, Alyssa literally told a teacher that my father was dating when she was nine years old, she went up to this woman and said, I'm having sex with my dad. Like, there's just there's such there's such a backstory to this, you know, our, our father was a deputy sheriff for Maricopa County from 1970 to 1974. And he resigned shortly after, you know, he attempted to tamper with the crime scene of an attempted homicide that his brother committed against his wife. Like, there's just so well, much to your, this backstory. Your father's brother committed murder, and he was on the case? Atten he uh, It was attempted murder, and um, the Phoenix police have determined in their police reports that our father tampered with the scene, wa scene while he was a police officer. He, like, put bullets in his pocket. He possibly tried to put a knife in this woman's hand who was shot to make it look like self-defense. So there's a long history of him kind of engaging in this, you know, criminal behavior, as well as a very long history of him sexually abusing people that were close to him, you know, especially in in the family, like his um, his first wife's sister, my mom's sister, um, and, you know, lots of things going forward. And, and this is what the police in Phoenix are saying. It's all hearsay. It's all just stories, but we don't have any proof. So if you, you know, you said you had something like 25 people or whatever have, have said, I've heard these stories. You have other people who have been uh, harassed, molested, harmed, whatever. But that's just not enough in their eyes to move forward on anything. That's what they say. I mean, in that meeting in 2019, um, they say, you know, we don't have any allegations. And I'm like, hello, your department released these allegations to ABC 2020 and they aired for all of America to see in 2009. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Mm. So that's when I say that they're lying to me. That's what I mean is literally you say thing on ABC 2020, including that, um, you know, Alyssa told things very told people things that were very graphic, very detailed things. And then they turn around to me and say, no, that didn't happen. Um, you know, they in that ABC interview say we want to look in Desert Center, California for Alyssa's body. And then they tell me there's nowhere we can look for Alyssa's body. So, yeah, I would say that that's lying. Why are you telling ABC News one thing and telling me something completely different? Uh, speaking of, of like the body, wasn't there something, I, I can't remember what it was, but there's something about coordinates that were linked to, um, your father where it was like, they found bones where the coordinates were something like that. So there's two sides to that. So I found a map with, um, a, a lot of locations in California circled and they happened to be in the middle of the desert. Like, I in his house was, like in his stuff. I'm sorry, what was that? Like you found this map like in your house amongst your dad's belongings or like what? Yeah, I found it in a box full of stuff that I had transferred from his house. You know, I'm just like cleaning out my house and I find it and I freak out. And unfortunately, I don't make a copy or anything. I just give it to police uh -huh. um, and nothing came of it. Because at this point, I'm just trusting the police. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I have no reason to not trust the police. I just hand it over. I don't want it. I'm not qualified. Um, but unfortunately, those spots were never looked. But, you know, um, there was also this element of them finding these bones. Um, apparently, some hiker came across bones near where my father says um, two assassins killed Alyssa. Again, a huge backstory. Um, but those bones were tested. They believe that they might be male and older than, um, you know, Alyssa. So it's very unlikely that those bones are Alyssa's. Um, mm -hmm. But they are something that I've fought to be retested, and, and they will not. Do you think that was like he, that's someone else? he killed or someone like if you if you have coordinates and you circle a spot on a map and there are bones there i feel like that just speaks to 
maybe not a lifter, but some other sort of fucking weird well, behavior. He was, he was blaming that union, and then the that union was the place that he was trying to bomb with the pipe bombs. Correct. So I don't believe that they found the bones exactly where the coordinates were. And, you know, my dad says that he killed these two assassins, but they, you know, and you guys talked about it. They, they looked into it and those guys did die from natural causes long before Alyssa was gone. They were real people. Um, But my father was also found with a social security card with one of those guys names on it when they came and raided the house. Like there's, it's weird, right? Because you think it's such a crazy outlandish story and then you find something like that and and it's just so, uh, it's just so weird. I don't know how else to say it. And so it sounds like anything short of a body or a confession, confession is like nothing else is meeting their standard of, of evidence really. huh? But it has, you know, they did tell me when my father said to me, come to the deathbed and I'll give you all the honest answers you want to hear. They said that's not good enough. We can't accept that as evidence. Um, But, uh, you know, a week after that meeting, I get that email that says, just kidding, we're going to go ahead and move forward and Mm -hmm. present this case for prosecution. So, again, I don't know what happened between that week of me standing up for Alyssa's case and saying, good luck explaining this to the whole fucking world. when This gets immediate, more media attention. And that was like, okay, yeah, maybe that maybe that like scared him. I would have to think so, to be honest, if I'm. If I'm in law enforcement right now and and I've seen serial and the jinx and making a murderer and the endless list, even if it's not out of the goodness of my heart, like, hey, we should do the right thing for this girl and her family. I might be like, I'm not going to be the villain who's on the hook you know, with America hating me because I look the other way on this shit, uh, which is why I, part of me thinks it's amazing that doing this and the true crime fad can actually have tangible results. Part of me also is like sickened that that's what it fucking takes, you know, like right. what shit would not get done if there wasn't Netflix and podcasts and, and the like, you know? Yeah. Like you, you don't want a documentary to come out from her perspective. And then the mm-hmm. end say the police department was reached for comment and no one responded. Like you right. don't want that. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually can, I wasn't standing up for the police, but I was thinking in that, in that episode where you're saying like, you're lying to me, I can see an element where it's like, I'm new to this department or I wasn't originally on the case. It's, it's a lost cause. I got a lot of other shit to deal with. There's politics and bureaucracy. And that maybe it's not blatantly like a conspiracy against you, more just like laziness and indifference. And, yeah. And, yeah, and like it's a hopeless cause and I don't, you know, um, but, you know, but fuck that. I mean, that's your job. That's, that's, that's not how right. it should go. You know, is that how you feel? Like, do you feel like they were like, well, we got him on something else. So that's that's the same. He's 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 in prison. It doesn't matter. Like, we don't have to really get him on something else because he's already in jail. Do you think that there's an element of that here? I feel like at some point, the two detectives that worked on Alyssa's case for 10 years were just prevented from going forward. And I don't know why, because they did tell me and other people, you know, they told other people that my father would never get out of prison. They told many people that he would be tried for this when he did get out of prison. So that way he couldn't combine sentences and serve less time. And I really believe that those two detectives wanted this to move forward. My God, it was 10 years of their life. There's no way that they were like, eh, just we forget about it. Like, we don't care anymore. I just don't see that as being plausible. So I think whatever happened when it got to the top, they said, we're not moving forward with this. Maybe it's not worth our time. I don't think it's this huge conspiracy against me or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it probably does lean more towards laziness, more towards this isn't a completely open and shut case because we don't have a body. This is not a guaranteed win for us. Right. So we're not going to waste our time. Um, I, I think I lean more towards that as opposed to, you know, like, some crazy conspiracy well that's that's what i hope though that pressure like this it's like well it is worth your time now because you're going to be you know vilified in in pop culture and that can be just as you know detrimental to anything uh you know in your in your career but it's it's like what are what so when they they finally did submit are you now just waiting still is that what happened after that Yeah. um, So they really, really dragged their feet. In my opinion, it took them 18 months to fulfill everything the state asked for. And it wasn't until just a few months before or really a few weeks before they finished submitting everything that they assigned a bunch of people to it to to finish it up. So, yeah, I mean, the case has only been in the state's hands for like 
two weeks or something. Um, but, no. you know, when they first said that, they told me I would know in two weeks and then another two weeks. So this has been 18 months of me wondering every single day if my father's going to be arrested today. And on top of that, the police released the news of this prosecution to NBC News, um, which was terrifying um, in my mind. You know, I begged them. I, I prevented this story from coming out before because my biggest fear is that my father kills himself. And then this case goes away forever. And that doesn't seem to be a concern of theirs. Um, so, yeah, it's it's very scary right now. Every day is torture. And I just sit here and wait to see if I'm going to you know, see it on the news. Are you worried for yourself at all? Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my goodness, he's like 10 minutes from my house last I heard. That's yeah. terrifying. Like, are you taking any like precautions or are you, you know, do you live alone? Are you, I mean, that sounds, I would be, I was joking around half joking. Like I'm afraid to even be in the mix at all. Cause I, you know, this guy sounds like a fucking lunatic. Yeah. And a lot of people feel that way, to be totally honest. That's why a lot of people didn't want to interview for the podcast because they're so afraid of my father. But yes, I have lots of protections in place. I like to tell people I have, you know, armed guards and a moat and a, a drawbridge. And um, but yeah, needless to say, I am I am extremely safe. I'm curious about the the feedback that you've been getting from the viral TikTok videos. Like, I'm sure like you're probably getting uh, and this is probably infuriating to you people reaching out being like, Hey, I have a tip or like, Hey, like I said, like, have you, have you gotten any of that where it's, it's probably very difficult for you to sift through what's real and what's bullshit. And I'm sure there is a, like a lot of bullshit that's coming your way because of the exposure that the videos are getting. By the way, real quick, 750,000 followers on TikTok now, even just in, I mean, I looked at your account maybe like, I don't know, a week ago and you were like 400 something. So, I mean, exploding on TikTok, which I'm sure as Jared just said is, helpful, but also can be, you know, uh, chaotic. Yeah. I mean, my goodness, there's been like 80 million views in the past week or something. It's, Yikes. it's really insane. So yeah, I have been getting tips. Um, nothing super amazing. I did get one where this guy said, you know, I think I found a grave in the desert and I saw a guy that looked like your dad walking away from it. And of course I freak out. Right. But the first way I vet these tips is to go, OK, are you comfortable with me sharing this to the police? Because if they say no, then I'm like, you're full of shit. Like, you know what I mean? I, I don't. And he's like, yeah, I've called the police twice. They came out here for five minutes and didn't do anything. And I'm like, OK, this sounds legit. You know, I talked to my friend in law enforcement who says that sounds legit. It could be a little sketch, but legit. Um, and I tell the police and they don't answer for like a week. So what do I do? I go out there myself. I film everything and I try to I try to find it because what do I do? I, I can't trust that the police are going to act with a sense of urgency. And in this case, they did not. Um, eventually, they did come around and, and come out and bring dogs and whatnot, which I was really thankful for because that's never happened. And it didn't pan out. But yeah, I mean, when I get these tips, I submit them to the police. Um, and if I am sitting around for a week or whatever, guess what? I'm going to go out there and film everything so, you know, I, I didn't mess around or tamper with anything mm -hmm. and explore it for myself. And if I find something, I'm going to call 911 because I, I just don't trust that you guys are acting with urgency and sometimes with the best intentions for Alyssa's case. Um, but yeah, there's been a lot of different tips. People have said, I met her at that at that pool that you showed in that video. Um, just stuff like that. But nothing, nothing super amazing. A lot of psychics saying, I feel this. Can I read her? I think her body's here. That type of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I saw one big thing I keep seeing is recently the uh, like new international hand signal for I'm I need help. I'm being abused. Something like you put your thumb and you close it up and it slightly sort of looked like what Alyssa was doing in the pool that day. But that was that's like, you know, within the past year. And this is something that happened to Alyssa 20 years ago. So I feel like a lot of people are like good intentions and want to help. But it's like, listen, you're not even remotely close to like, thanks, but don't get in the way here, you know? Yeah, I feel the same way, you know, and I get why people feel that way. But yeah, I believe that that is a newer hand sign that is not applicable to that video in any way. Um, but what I was hoping by sharing that video is that there would be some type of expert that would come forward and say, Alyssa is saying this. Not happened, I feel like that is a pretty, if you do, I mean, if anybody's living here that officially really knows sign language, that feels like something you'd be able to, you know, conclude or rule out pretty Pretty quickly. I, what I was reading was that she's, she's signing make and then kind of pointing at him and a sign for stop or something along those lines. But you're saying that there's been no concrete definitive answer on that one? 
Correct. A lot of people with a lot of experience have come forward with different conclusions. And so that's what's weird. So I think I need to see who has partnered with law enforcement before and get that aspect because the police always say we don't have it from Alyssa. We don't have a statement from Alyssa, which, of course, she's gone. You're not going to get that. So if there can be some type of statement concluded from this video, that is Alyssa speaking to them. Yeah. Or um, so, yeah. like hiding at her job uh, at that restaurant, like clearly scared and like hiding behind a wall be like, why the fuck are you filming me? I mean, I, I guess this is where when the police were saying this is not like tangible evidence. This is not yeah. concrete. But I also think that a mountain of circumstantial evidence has to count for something. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're talking about a jury or just regular people who can, who have regular brains that, you know, it doesn't all have to be perfectly by the letter of the law to at least move forward. Right. And then, and then also the, like we keep talking about the pool video, but there's another video where Alyssa is saying dad's a pervert and he takes the camera. And why does that video still exist? Like if he has these contracts saying like, like sign here to say that like, I've never sexually assaulted you. And then she signs them. And then there's a video of her saying dad's a pervert. Why does he not delete that video immediately? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So what happened when the police raided the house is they took all of our home videos. Um, and, you know, afterwards, I asked for them back. It's the only thing left I have of my mom and my sister. I never expected there to be this dynamic, you know, evidence in there, essentially. Um, but that video is just a larger, it's a part of a larger video of us camping. But it, uh, what you guys don't see is that entire camping video, there's some type of weird tension between my father and Alyssa. Like, um, I I'm trying to kind of, you know, hang out with Alyssa and he's like, leave her alone. She's really upset right now. She like goes and like starts like jumping rock to rock. Like it just it's very, very weird. You can tell that there's a lot of tension. And then, you know, it cuts to me. I, I'm the, the person filming the video and, and I'm just feel like, like 12 years old or something. Yeah. I, yeah. Something like that. 10, maybe. Um, I was just really young. Right. So I'm filming it. And um, essentially, you know, my dad's like, turn the camera off or whatever. I'm sorry, I forget I forget the exact sequence of events, but this is like, hey, Sarah, Sarah, dad's a pervert. And I'm just kind of sitting there like, that's funny, like, whatever. I don't know what's going on. And my dad's like, turn the camera off, press the red button. And then he grabs the camera from me. And I just like laugh and like skip along. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just found that in our home videos. And I remember finding it and like taking a video on my phone and like sending it to my friends. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And they're like, you need to put that out there. This is insane. Like this is a direct statement from Alyssa. Um, but, you know, I don't think the police see it that way. How could they not? I mean, it's from directly from the source. Normal joke or a normal thing you'd ever say. Like that's. I mean, I got kids. If they ever like said something like that, I'd be like, you don't know what that word means. We have to talk about this. Like, why did you say that? This is, uh, you know, you're, you're confused. I don't know that his reaction was kind of like, you know, she's saying it and she shouldn't be. And I, again, I, I don't know what the, the preponderance of evidence is or, but to a normal person, these things are all like screaming that he's at least to be, investigated and tried and you know so i have a question i i was watching like a, a youtube video about the case and there was something mentioned about like the dr doolittle tape do you are you familiar with that what's what's the deal with that because like it was it was like a tape that existed but it wasn't like i don't think that you've seen it but someone saw it there was a sketchy source so it, like your father was trying to say that he wasn't credible yeah. And to be fair, I didn't believe it at first either until I talked to this person. Um, but essentially, there was a cousin that lived with me, my father and Alyssa in the late 90s. Um, my father called him and said, you know, Alyssa's out of control. I just need some help. You want to come live with us for a little bit? You can get back on your feet, that type of thing. This guy just he was an alcoholic. I didn't really go much further than that. Um, but essentially, this guy, you know, it's our cousin. He gets home from work. Um, he got Filiberto's or whatever. He, pop, he goes to the couch and he wants to pop in a video. And, you know, my dad was one of those dads who recorded everything off TV onto VHS tapes to save money or whatever. So he pops in Dr. Doolittle and it's not Dr. Doolittle. It is um, a video of a girl that he believes to be Alyssa 
on our couch laying horizontally um, naked from the waist up with just shorts on and there's a newspaper over her face and it's eerily quiet. And that happens for, you know, I, I don't know how long. And then it cuts to another girl who he believes was Alyssa's friend um, in the same scenario, naked from the waist up, just shorts on with a newspaper over her face. And I didn't believe it at first until I talked to this man and saw how regretful he was. And on top of that, he reported this to our aunt and to our grandma, who essentially just said, yeah, we we kind of know. Um, essentially, there, there, there's probably other tapes like they, they just were aware of it didn't do anything, didn't report it. And our uncle was like, I can't believe he only told you about the one tape. It was my understanding that there were more. So, yeah. So family sources do confirm that this cousin at least called and told people about it. Um, this cousin also, the moment he saw the video, took out the tape, put it on top of the machine, packed his shit, left and never came back and never talked to, talked to our dad again. I don't know what to say. Are, are we saying that this was like um, when? When is this? Like after the disappearance? Is this like footage of her body? Is this footage of her asleep? We don't know. It's just a girl naked with a newspaper over her face. That's the most creepy shit I've ever heard. Yeah, so it was before she went missing. And there's a few elements to this, right? So our brothers can actually confirm that they found a similar video that was marked something else that contained a sex tape with one of our, you know, a consensual sex tape with one of our father's ex-girlfriends. Um, so there's that element to it as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's pretty damning, the the evidence. And, and, um, and, and the yeah. girl, I believe to be Alyssa, is not saying anything. Is she moving? Is, is there... No, she's just laying there still. And, you know, our father actually um, used to give us prescription medication quite often. So I don't see that, um, you know, being out of the realm of possibility in, in terms of these girls being drugged and literally just laying there. Right. Is there ever any, um, like, child protective services, just not from murder or disappearance, but just things like that, drugs and filming and, you know, or was it all just kind of, you know, in-house, you want to ask, don't tell, you're, you know, behind closed doors type shit. Yeah, I mean, the cousin just told other family members. He went to, you know, our grandmother and our aunt, and they didn't do anything. And I think he was too afraid to report it. It's one of his biggest regrets, he says, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I get, like you said, families have drama, and you don't want to get involved in people's business too much. But, but then there's certain lines you cross, like having home videos of naked girls with their faces being covered. I mean, that's just... You can't not speak up on that. That's crazy. Right. right. And, I agree. And like, obviously that is a, not just a red flag. It's just damning evidence. Yeah. But and another red flag here would be um, how he was this paranoid guy that had cameras in the house everywhere. But then on the day that Alyssa disappears, uh, there's no footage of that on any of his cameras because he says that he looked at the footage and nothing suspicious was on it. So he just got rid of it. I got it, guys. Don't worry. I mean, come on. Yeah, pretty much. Well, and he's told a lot of different stories about that footage. He has said the cameras were never on. They malfunctioned. I had the footage and it was gone. Just like the day that she went missing. There's a, a million different stories that he tells about everything. Yeah. It, it's, there's any element of because he's ex-military, ex-law enforcement, that it, it is like a conspiracy of like protection or you think it's still more just laziness and, uh, you know, whatever, indifference. It's hard to tell. It's hard. I, I really don't go towards a, a large conspiracy. And for years and years, I would interview and people would say, do you think it's because he's ex law enforcement? And I would say no. But, you know, with all this movement going on and seeing these stats about officers in Arizona specifically just never being prosecuted for crimes like mm -hmm. the rates are just so, so low. It could be a factor, um, but I don't I, I don't know. I don't know. I just think that something terrible happened here. It's very obvious when you compile all of these different circumstances and factors. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear what happened and, and why there's been no movement up to this point is I have no idea. And there's been no other uh, person of interest or suspect, right? It's not even like they can say, you know, you're looking in the wrong direction. There's really only one direction to look right now. Correct. Yeah. I mean, there were people throughout that they looked into that were uh, persons of interest that were eliminated, you know, things like the boyfriend, people she worked with, some guy that worked at her school that would come to, you know, her place of work and get food or whatever. Um, but all those people were eliminated as persons of interest. So with the boyfriend, the day that Alyssa goes missing, your father picks her up early from school 
And was it your father who said that the reason why Alyssa wanted to be picked up early was to break up with her boyfriend, even though she visited him like in class that day, like popped her head in and said, Hey, and they were supposed to like go to a party together party. that night. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Our father says, you know, do you know why I was picking her up from school that day, Sarah? Because she wanted to break up with her boyfriend. And I'm like, okay, that's also not Alyssa. Alyssa was the the most straight shooter, badass girl, strong I ever knew. She would never beat around the bush with her boyfriend or be afraid of anyone, um, maybe except our father. But yeah, he he literally Alyssa, before she left, popped her head in the shop class um, to her boyfriend and said, bye, I'll see you later, because they were supposed to go to a party that night. She also bumped into another friend and said, OK, I'll, I'll see you at graduation because she was uh, due to go to graduation and that party. And, you know, the last person that ever saw Alyssa was that friend getting into our father's truck and she was absolutely never seen again. That is cr- I mean, how, how have you um, I mean, you sound so articulate and well put together and calm about the whole thing is that, I mean, have you just kind of come to to terms with everything? I, I feel like learning and, and being convinced and believing that your dad's kind of like a monster and now living this life where you're like immersed in it. Are you good? I mean, I feel like that take a toll mentally and emotionally. Um, how, what's, what's that experience like? Yeah, I mean, of course, it takes its toll. And I have good days and I have bad days. Um, But for me, it's very black and white. You know, Alyssa suffered through all of this abuse when I didn't. Um, Alyssa's friends have come forward and said, you know, she wanted to move out when she was 18, but she didn't want to run away because she didn't want to leave you alone with him, Sarah. And that, you know, gives you a sense of guilt um, that really pushes me forward. I always say that this is kind of like my active form of grieving. Mm -hmm. And yeah, of course, throughout doing so many interviews and having to literally research this case myself, I have become well versed on it and and unfortunately articulate. Um, You know, in my past career experience helps with that as well. I was in, you know, events and marketing and stuff. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's just it's what I have to do for me. It's very black and white. It's very right versus wrong. And this was my only course of action, my first thought wasn't, oh my gosh, let me go tell the whole world about my entire family's dirty laundry. The police told me, sorry, we changed our minds. We're not going to prosecute anymore. Your best chance is to get media exposure. And I took that very seriously and um, yeah, crafted it into this whole movement that has happened. So it's it's been three years of me doing this. Um, So yeah, I think I have become a little hardened to it. Um, Mm -hmm. It just is what it is. I tell this story a lot. Um, and, and yeah, it, it's just a mission. And I've kind of um, spearheaded that, you know, no one else in the family wants to do media, although everyone believes the same thing. I was the last person to come around. I'm the only one that really speaks for her. So I've been forced into this position and it is what it is. I just have to do it. Like I said, you know, she would do it for me. And mm. that's what I'm here to do. Yeah, that's that's and like, hopefully like or is it your hope that eventually this gains enough traction becomes some sort of Netflix special and then there is like a groundswell of support where there's no way that it it could be denied or there's no way that it could be ignored like is that is that your primary goal right now yeah I think it's my only option you see how media affects these cases and I get emails every day from people who say I want to you know create a documentary with you and pitch this to Netflix like that isn't just a bluff with police there are things that are Mm -hmm. happening I'm still getting these emails every day people are very interested because I think Mm -hmm. there's something about Alyssa's story that sticks with people I don't know Mm -hmm. what it is but people become very passionate about it so yeah I think that's that's really my only course of action I have tried every normal legal route to get the police to do this Um, but I'm here now and I really hope and I've seen Alyssa's story is already changing people's lives and affecting people. So Mm -hmm. outside of wanting prosecution, which of course is what I want, it's something I want to continue to pursue because I've seen Alyssa affecting people's lives. And that is so moving to me and and really means a lot. Yeah, I I think the biggest thing, too, is that the case, not only is the case still cold or open, it's that there's so much evidence that just slaps you in the face in Mm -hmm. regards to like what should be done about it like we so we started like this crime podcast and i was telling friends and and everyone about it and everyone kept saying the same thing like do cases that are resolved at the end because like when you listen to it you want that like 
sigh of relief at the end where everyone knows the conclusion. And then there's just like some anxiety about a case that just like isn't solved yet that people hate. So it's almost like if you put this out in the world, you're going to create that anxiety that they're talking about where it's like, I need to figure this out. Like now you're creating almost like an army of people that become passionate about the same case that you are obviously for different reasons, but people get so intertwined with it. And we've seen it before where people like bypass law enforcement and they figure these things out on their own. And and you're obviously doing that right now. And you're just going to create more like-minded people like yourself. Yeah. I mean, I I understand when people want a a story with a resolution. I get it. In my mind, from a family member's perspective, I see true crime as an avenue for advocacy, which means presenting these stories without resolutions. Like, I'm sorry if it doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy inside, but this is Mm -hmm. real life. And that's kind of how I end Alyssa's timeline in my podcast is like, I've thought about the ending for a long time, and I wish I could give you a nice, neat package you could walk away with. But guess what? It's cold and it's empty and it sucks. And I need your help and that's the reality of the situation so that's that's the type of true crime i like to make is this like you said this real raw audio like don't just listen to me bitching about this meeting with police hear it for yourself hear it for yourself i think that's the key from a to be like crass about it from like an entertainment point of view for people who are tuning in to an effective point of view when you have there's unfortunately a million missing persons cases when you have home video when you have strange circumstances, when you have pseudo confessions, that's the kind of shit that I think people go like, wait, what? And then you're telling your friend and they, you you know, it, it's such an injustice that you have to tweet about it and post about it. And I, and, and I mean, it's, it's horrible and it's creepy and I'm sure traumatic for you, but having those videos and having uh, some of those allegations and the letter, and I mean, it's like a movie. You feel like you're watching a movie and unfortunately for you and your family it's real life but i think fortunately it's what's going to separate you from other uh cases that it's going to gain a lot of traction and hopefully that's enough traction that the, that law enforcement agency can't deny it anymore yeah that's the whole point i mean you can literally hear Alyssa sing her abcs you hear her at her birthday parties you hear that audio of her jack-in-the-box calling her co-worker you know um an asshole or whatever mm-hmm. um you hear her grow up and that was the point is i want to make you fall in love with Alyssa. but you also hear this other raw audio from my father you know you hear him in the 1970s recording young girls saying um you know you're really pretty you're really pretty mm-hmm. and then you hear all these stories about him and it just helps solidify it again don't take it from me take it from these police reports take it from this real audio of our father going up to young girls saying this um Mm -hmm. i think it's just a huge element that speaks for itself and it allows me to step back and not input my own opinion because there's almost no opinion of mine in that podcast it is so much case file so much home video it's just raw and it speaks for itself and i'm very fortunate to have all this footage but yeah i think that's definitely the most dynamic piece of it do you think that you'll have the opportunity or even want the opportunity to confront him? Um, I mean, I have. When he got out of prison, I, you know, I was like, this is my chance. You know, he's out of prison. It's not going to be staffed with security guards. It's not going to be on a recorded line. And he just taunted me. He was a complete asshole to me. Like he said, you know, come to my deathbed and I'll tell you all the honest answers you want to hear. He said, were I'll you, agree to everything. What was that, that did you call him up or, or, or was that on the phone or was that in person? And did you say like, Hey, I think you murdered my sister. Like what, what was the actual conversation like? Yeah. So that was in person. Um, it's, it's so long. It's literally two episodes of my podcast. You can hear all the audio and it's, it's me saying, yeah, I think you did this. And him trying to say like, well, if you're here to, you know, reconnect with me and have a relationship, this isn't the way to do it. And I'm like, I don't want that. That's not why I'm here, bro. That's not what we're doing here, man. Jesus. No, I confront him right away. And he's like, so you really think I killed your sister? And I say, yeah. And he's like, why? And I'm like, to cover up the sexual abuse. And he like laughs like a maniac. He sounds like a complete insane person. He tries to intimidate me by like leaning forward because we're at like a, you know, a a Starbucks bistro table next to the drive through these poor people working there. But yeah, he he really just tries to taunt me, you know, and he also says, um, I'll agree to confess if the state gives me lethal injection within 10 days. Like it's not just that part to me was like you you could maybe say uh, maybe on my deathbed, I'll tell you whatever I want. And that's just you're frustrated or you're mouthing off, whatever to say, like, I'll confess as long as I know X, Y, Z is going to happen. 
that to me is a confession. I mean, that's, right. I know you need like certain levels of evidence with law enforcement, but again, from a common sense point of view, that is as damning and as red flag as it gets. Yeah. And Arizona is a one party consent state, meaning that 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 recording is completely legal. So why they don't take it as evidence is really astounding to me. I really yeah. don't understand it. He Like he just. Yeah, it, it's the most horrible conversation where he says terrible things about Alyssa. There's no point where he breaks down and he says, I just miss her so much. She was such mm-hmm. a good girl. Like, I'm so sad about this. I can't believe you guys believe this. He just deflects and is defensive and, and really cruel. You know, he's like, I, you know, you and Alyssa were that close, huh? And I'm like, yeah, she raised me because you were a piece of shit. Like, I don't. I, yeah, we were that close. She was basically the only mom I ever had. What do you expect? It, it's just it's a horrendous conversation. Um, but I'm really glad I ca- I captured the audio because you, again, hear it directly from him. Don't take it from me. Hear it from him when I ask him these questions and come to your own conclusion. Did, did you walk away from that conversation with no doubt in your mind that that he was um, responsible Yeah, that erased any doubt in my mind that I had. Um, There's, you know, another conversation on there, too, in June of 2019, which is the last time I spoke with him. And I was approached by ABC 2020 and they said, we want you back on because your your opinions changed because I was on there saying my dad's innocent. He could never do this because that's really what I thought. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, come back on. We want your dad back on. So I call him, ask him. He says, no. I say, listen, I need you to advocate for Alyssa. If you really didn't do this and you're really Mm -hmm. sad about it please advocate for her because any interview you do is going to get a thousand times more traction than what I do. And he basically hangs up on me. That's such a great point. I didn't even think of that. It's like, okay, fine. If you didn't, then aren't you upset that mm-hmm. your, your daughter is, is, is gone, is missing. I mean, it's a stepdaughter at least. I feel like that's such a part of it too. Biological treated one way, step treated the other way. It's, it's, it's just, Fucked, man. And I can't believe, like, even if I was in law enforcement and I was jaded by the whole process and I hate my boss and I hate my cases and all that other shit that that stops you from doing this. Like when you hear things like that or see these videos, how do you not like clear everything else? And and at least or maybe, yeah, you got other work to do, but at least do something for the girl. I mean, I know they promised you the billboards and and all that kind of shit. And they just don't ever follow through on that. Yeah, that, yes, um, that was definitely one point of contention that just kind of pissed me off. Like, if you never told me that I would have a billboard in every freeway in Phoenix for Alyssa, I wouldn't be so upset about it. Don't get your hopes up, right? Like, I mean, don't tell me that unless you're going to do it. Yeah, and that's when they told me they weren't going to prosecute. You know what I mean? They were like, mm-hmm. you know, we need a body. We need a witness. We're not going to prosecute. But what we're going to do, Sarah, don't worry, is this huge silent witness campaign. And that never happened. And when I go back to them, you know, I, I had to go to the chief of police to get this meeting with the commander. And I'm like, listen, I never got my silent witness campaign. And she's like, who told you you'd have a silent witness campaign? And it's like, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. Are you kidding me? It's extremely well, disappointing. Okay. And not okay. Mm-hmm. While that was, that's probably, that would comfort you in the sense that you know they're trying, but what you're doing is infinitely more Mm -hmm. than a billboard. I I totally get that. It's like, if they were willing to do the billboard, that means they're focusing on it and they're cooperating, but just know that a billion billboards is not going to do even a fraction of what your one TikTok did. So like kudos to you for taking it into your own hands because I think some of the measures they even would be allowed to do if they took interest aren't going to aren't going to do uh, in a fraction of what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I didn't have another alternative. I was on every other platform before TikTok and I was like, all right, you know, I felt so stupid doing TikTok. I know. It was slightly yeah. inappropriate. The um, video you made like when all when your friend when all the haters are saying like you're silly for for making a TikTok and you get, you know, this many views. It's, it was great. It's like, yeah, I know it's for dancing and stupid shit but you can use it in any way you want and like it's working so fuck off yeah no i got so much shit for joining tiktok from like podcast (laughs) friends and stuff they're like what the fuck are you doing and i'm like anything i can i don't know bro i'm just fucking trying it out right and then and then i'm like i have a hundred thousand followers you guys need to do this and they're like yeah whatever and then i'm like you know getting close to a million and i'm like what up bitches you see the fucking article in l about me being in tiktok (laughs) like you want to try it now um so yeah it's unexpected are you are you making like a career out of this? Like, are you going to do other cases? Is this something you want to run with from a professional point of view? Or is this, you know, just about Alyssa? 
I mean, it was just about Alyssa, but at this point, I feel like I have a mission and so many people have asked me for help and it's been extremely successful. You know, the podcast hit number eight of all podcasts on Apple Podcasts, which blew my mind. And yeah, now I feel like it's a mission that kind of chose me that I'm very passionate about. And it will be very hard for me to go back to events and marketing and, and doing, you know, yeah. fancy events for fancy people with wine and food and whatnot. It just right. obviously isn't as as meaningful. So yeah, this is definitely something I, I hope can be my career because it's just something I'm super passionate about and something that, you know, I, I'm told that I, I'm skilled at. So yeah, well, yeah. that's the thing. We've been talking about uh, HBO's doc, uh, I'll Be Gone in the Dark mm -hmm. with Michelle McNamara. And like she unfortunately passed away, but it seemed like she had that the gift of like how to how to investigate and how to empathize with victims and, and all that. And we were saying how it's a shame because as true crime has taken off, she probably would have been, you know, at the peak of it where other people with other cases would come to her and platforms would want to work with her and articles would be written. And honestly, I mean, you seem like that could be you. Oh, my goodness. That is such a compliment because I respect her so much and rest in peace, of course. But yeah, I mean, if I can, I, I will. I would love to. I'm extremely passionate about it. And I feel like a lot of, you know, creators, you know, and, and no tea, no shade or whatever, just don't go as far and become as radical as I do with it. Right. Like, I, I'm just very blunt and to the point. And if I can have evidence to back it up, I'm going to say it. I'm not going to be afraid to say it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would love that. Well, I mean, I, I hope I hope that works out, but obviously first and foremost would be uh, some sort of resolution in this case because it is it's heartbreaking, it's tragic, it's infuriating from a like a citizen point of view. And like your dad unfortunately is such a smug asshole about it that I I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know if there could ever be anything where you guys, you and your family have uh, solace and you can truly sleep at night, but whatever it is that could bring you guys some peace, I, I really desperately hope it happens. Well, thank you very much. I, I am. And I really, and I said this a couple weeks ago, I think it's gonna, I, I yeah. you, what you're doing is at least, uh, I can't speak to whether or not you'll feel peace, but I think this is going to grow big enough that they will have to do something. And mm -hmm. I don't know whether he can be, whether or not he can get convicted or what the evidence situation is. But I don't think it's going to be uh, a, like you just have to give up one day. I think that they will have to take note because the amount of traction you've already gotten is incredible. Well, thank you. Yeah, I hope so, too. Do you believe it, though? Like you hope so. But where if I had, you know, if I asked you right now, do you think that there will be a trial? Do you think that there will be an arrest? Do you think where do you think it ends up realistically? Yeah, I do. I absolutely yeah. do. I think that there's a lot of factors that, you know, compound into that. This is also an election year for the county attorney. So she's going to have to answer as to whether, you know, why she didn't go forward with this mm -hmm. and basically have the whole world screaming at her. If they turn this down, all I have to do is really say they said no. And people are going to go absolutely insane. They mm -hmm. already do go insane over this case. There's there's just so much public interest that I think that they're they're kind of you know, they're kind of forced. Um, but I don't think it's it's being forced without proper evidence in place, if that makes sense. I think right. it's always a gamble to go to trial without a body. But Alyssa is by no means the first no body case that has been tried and won successfully, even in Maricopa County, where the case currently stands. So I feel like they have to give it a fair shot. You know, why tell me for years and years and years that this thing was definitely going to be prosecuted if there wasn't enough evidence? It was the it like again if they say no fine but I'm just, the fact that they finally submitted it is like i'm just asking for the first goddamn step guys mm -hmm. so the fact that you at least knocked that that roadblock down i hope it's uh the first of many more to come and you definitely got two allies over here so anything we can do to like promote it amplify it retweet it post it like whenever there's a new piece of evidence wherever there's a new whatever please you know keep in touch and send it over because we'd love to help as much as we can. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm about to, I'm trying to find um, a neighbor. Uh, Alyssa supposedly ran to this neighbor after being attempted to, uh, attempting, my father attempting to sexually assault Alyssa. She runs to this neighbor and begs him for help, and the police have never been able to find him. So I think that's going to be my next call to action in terms of social media, because I think if we find that guy, 
that could be extremely helpful. So yeah, you will definitely hear from me and I appreciate you guys for having me on because it, it's a huge help. You are now a part of the fight for Alyssa. So thank Absolutely, you. Absolutely, man. Love that. 